Hey there crew and welcome to another update on the ongoing eruption happening in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is Friday, April 19th, about 9.30 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, 3.30 p.m. in Iceland. Thanks for joining me. There's been a few developments and some news that's come out over the past two days since my last live stream update with you. So I thought I'd jump on and put together a video update to share with you some of the things that have been happening in Iceland. So thanks for joining me and let's get right to it. So you can see that today is uh, not a great weather day in Iceland. It's rainy and stormy and cloudy and windy, uh, but nonetheless our erupting spatter cone volcano continues to chug along, uh, emitting lava from its base, which is feeding a perched lava channel and lava pond complex, along with eruptions within the spatter cones crater, uh, which are charged with gases and occasionally cause uh, lava, like there you go, little explosions of lava to uh, reach the rim and add to the flank and the rim of the cone, building it up over time. Uh, nonetheless, we've seen this kind of activity over the past probably two weeks or so since early April. And so it continues to go along. But we're going to look at some of the uplift data as well because I believe we're heading uh, towards a new phase in this volcano and maybe some unprecedented territory when it comes to some of the activity we've seen there over the past few months. So I uh, want to give a quick shout out and appreciation to a gentleman, uh, Leon Frey from Switzerland. He has a YouTube channel and has recently put together some drone footage and I reached out to him and he was uh, kind enough to let me show portions of his drone footage. He asked that I not show the entirety of the videos, but uh, that I was okay to show portions of that. So, um, as you well know, there's you know very few people operating drones over the eruption site, and some of them are like Leon are uh, happy to share uh, limited portions of their footage, which I greatly appreciate. Uh, other drone operators are a little bit more protective of their material, so we kind of get what we can. But nonetheless, these observations from above are a good way for us to see what's going on. So this is a short clip here. Uh, I want to show a few pieces of this one here from April 17th, from Wednesday. And remember in my last update on Wednesday, I was so somewhat speculating and I, I had a hunch. It looked like it was a perched lava channel and pond. I just wasn't 100% sure, but I think it's much more conclusive uh, with this view here. So we can take a look here. And again, thanks to Leon. I'll make sure I link to his YouTube channel if you'd like to watch some of his video clips in entirety. So here we can see the erupting cone, the spatter cone. Uh, and then just behind it here, we can see the active lava channel, lava pond area. And we can see these levees that run along the margins of that. And it's pretty clear here from uh, my vantage point that this is an elevated area with respect to this flank and these lower areas. So this drops down in elevation uh, a few meters or maybe even a, a tens of meters or so off in, in, in this direction and presumably on the other side, although we can't see through the gas plume there. Uh, so this nicely shows both the cone uh, and we'll see a few other views. He did quite a bit with the eruption inside the, the crater. And so we'll look at some other views there, but this one I think is a nice view of, you can see the levee now on the opposite side, on the Eastern side, uh, that's confining this lava channel uh, and pond complex here. Uh, it's elevated above the surrounding areas and the, the levees are the thing that's somewhat containing that. And this is why we still have a bit of a hazard here because increased flow through here or collapse of one of these levees could send the lava that's pooled here in this pond down this slope and coming down a, a slope this steep, it would move much faster. Uh, and that's why we want to be very careful about or Iceland officials, I suppose, want to be careful about how they allow uh, folks to access this site if and when they, they do. So a uh, little bit more of this little clip here. Um, so that's the perch lava pond. Let me skip around a little bit. Again, he asked that I not show the entirety of it. So I just want to feel, show a few tens of seconds of this clip and then another one from the next day. Uh, so this one here shows, uh, let's see, some of the steep walls of the crater. So you can see that inside the spatter cone as this lava is being ejected out, uh, you can see how sheer 
the the interior crater walls are at the summit of the spatter cone. Here they're they're very vertical, maybe a little bit overhanging, and over here on the north side they're even overhanging a little bit, um, and that's why these are prone sometimes to collapse. So this lava that's being ejected from the vent will stick to the sides of the walls. But because it's very hot, uh, you'll see sometimes it kind of drips back down. You can see some pieces tumbling down. Um, and you can see how this is somewhat unstable and is prone to collapse over time. Uh, so a couple seconds there of it. And then let me skip ahead to about here, which is just a similar view um, that shows you some more of the this crater there. You can see some of the lava just being ejected from the active vent, sticking to the walls, building up the sides of the cone there. So let me switch to the next day's video. So then he put the drone up on yesterday on April 18th and a few little sections I want to show here. Uh, again a nice overview uh, that shows the perch lava pond. Out here we can see there's some glow out on this uh, out to the southwest over here and I've seen in pre there's some lava that's getting through uh, maybe going through a tube system out of the the lava pond, there is some areas, I think, along the, the margin of the flow out here to the east um, that's incandescent as well. And that, that may be a tube system that's feeding that there because I don't think there's a continuous channel out there. But nonetheless, there's some getting out there to the margins. Um, so a nice overview of the, the eruptive vent and the lava pond. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit, remember in my update on Wednesday, we introduced this new topic and, and looked at some videos from Kilauea in Hawaii of crustal foundering. So these big slabs of solidified lava, which are somewhat cooled, crusted over, solidified, and therefore more dense than the underlying molten lava, which still has a, a significant amount of gas in it when more, and is more buoyant. And we talked about crustal foundering. And so this overhead view uh, from the lava pond area, I'm assuming, nicely shows some of these slabs of crust sinking back down and the process of lava foundering. So you can see a nice little view there of that. Uh, and then skipping ahead a little bit, and you, again, I'll put a link to these, and you can watch the entirety of these on his, lava ch on his YouTube channel, if you'd like, of going into the cone area and really looking at some of the, the spatter, how it sticks to the sides, how sometimes it drips back down. And this is building up that material uh, once this is cooled off and solidified more or less. This is what we call a glutinate. I'll also put a link to, um, I realized this yesterday in looking at some of the uh, conversations taking place on different social media platforms that there were some questions about cinder cones versus spatter cones. And then I realized I just did videos not that long ago of a spatter cone in Northern California and a cinder cone in Southern Utah, obviously not erupting, but to see the material and see what those look like a little bit better. And so I'll put links to those in this video, uh, in this video description as well. So if you're interested in seeing what this looks like and seeing this material up close after it's cooled off and a few thousand years have gone, gone by, um, we can look at that as well. Uh, but nice view here. You can see pieces of it kind of falling off. But mainly this stuff is so hot that it's sticking and welding to the surface uh, upon contact, especially when it gets up higher, like this big blob, blob there. Let's go back just a skosh here. Um, you know, when it gets out of the boom right there, like this material right here that gets out of the active vent region where it's still quite hot, you know, there's still a lot of... Um, conductive heat that's rising off of this thing and so you can get a little bit more of this material accumulating over on this side so so again thanks to uh, Leon Frey hope, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right uh, for letting me show a few clips of your drone videos I appreciate that greatly um, yeah I think if, yeah we could if everyone would just share everything that would be great uh, but some folks uh, have copyright on their stuff and they're very protective and I understand that so um, okay, so literally as I was getting ready for this update today, again, April 19th, um, a new update came out from the Met Office. And so I barely had time to scroll through this and get the key points. So let's go through this together. Uh, it's a bit of a long one, but I think it's really insightful. And I think there's some, uh, they lay out a few possible scenarios as we move forward. Um, and so actually, 
yeah, let's just go through it and then we'll come back to the GPS data. I think everyone knows if and if you don't, um, there is still uplift occurring. We still have the ground beneath the Svartsingi area that's still rising. Um, and that's due to some of that magma's going into storage. So we still have magma rising into the crust. Some of it's being stored, some of it's erupting. Um, and that's uh, one of the reasons why the Met Office has issued this update along with some possible scenarios about how this could play out. So continued land rise increasing, the likelihood of an, another magma flow, even though an eruption is ongoing. Remember that this phrase uh, magma flow in this context could either mean magma making its way to the surface as an eruption or magma moving from the storage area through the crust in any given direction and then stalling or what we might call an intrusion. Uh, more uncertainty about the development of the earthquakes in the coming days or weeks. So a couple key points here. Land rise in Svartsingi continues at a steady pace. Since April 5th, one crater has erupted. That's our main primary spatter cone. And the lava flow from it has remained fairly constant at just over three cubic meters per second. So that's the flow rate coming out of that. I've seen other uh, geologists say that if you get below this, that that will end the eruption. Uh, and, and I don't know that per se. I, I, I never learned that there was anything um, critical about that number, but assuming they're right, we're kind of right at that threshold that if the flow rate coming out of the vent decreases a little bit, um, that may not pr provide enough energy and activity for that lava to be emitted. And we may see this thing start to kind of uh, gum up and um, solidify over time. So we'll have to see if it slows down, we'll see if that holds true or not. Uh, still a risk of gas pollution. Uh, and then here's a key point. If the accumulation of magma under Svartsingi continues at a similar rate, so the magma going into the storage area, the probability of another magma flow increases in the coming days or weeks, even though the eruption is still ongoing. So even though we're erupting actively from a vent, there's more magma going into storage than it's coming out of the vent. And that's why it seems very likely that we're going to get that something's going to happen. Either magma is going to get fill up that storage zone, become pressurized, and then rise to the surface, possibly through the existing vent or possibly through a new vent, or that magma will move upwards and out and not make it to the surface and become an intrusion like we saw on March 2nd. Um, Okay, continuing on, when after the fourth eruption began on March 16th, land rise slowed down significantly for a while and almost stopped. It indicated that there was a balance between the inflow of magma into the chamber under Svartsingi and to the surface in the Sunuks crater series. And so we can see that on the GPS from those early days in March. So if you look at just this little section here, um, you know, immediately after the March 16th eruption, there just wasn't a lot of uplift happening in those first few days. And that seemed to be indicative of uh, the eruption keeping pace with the magma inflow. But continuing on, at the beginning of April, land pressure began to increase again. So the land began to rise. And now approximately as much of the magma is flowing to the surface as is accumulating in the magma chamber under Svartsingi with the associated increased magma pressure. So twice as much magma is coming into the system as you're seeing erupted at the surface. Therefore, half of that volume is going into the storage chamber. And they released these little uh, cartoon graphics a few days ago, um, but they're somewhat helpful to seeing kind of how things look. Um, realize that the, you know, the magma chamber is not an oval. The conduits to the surface are not smooth red you know, pathways. Uh, it's much more complicated than this, but this just illustrates the overall idea about what's going on. Okay, continuing on, the current situation is new as a volcanic eruption with fairly constant lava flow is going on in the Sunuks crater series at the same time as land is rising in Svartsingi. Therefore, there is more uncertainty now than before about the possible development of the event. So we're in uncharted waters. We've seen this thing in the past since October and into November have inflation uplift uh, and then magma leaving the system, sometimes forming intrusions, sometimes culminating in an eruption, but we've never seen both taking place at the same time. All those eruptions prior, the one in December, January, and February, all those eruptions lasted just a few days. They evacuated 
the eruptible magma, the pressurized magma, and then those eruptions ended. The whole system sort of reset and inflation began anew. But right now we're seeing something different. We're seeing actively ongoing eruptions of lava from that spatter cone, while at the same time simultaneously we have uh, magma rising and causing the system to inflate uh, as more magma is is intruded. And so this is what we're seeing now, something like this. Again, just very cartoonish, but this is the overall idea. Um, and that's the reason why um, we'll just have to wait and see. I don't think anyone has any real clear idea what's going to happen. And that's why this Met Office update lays out a couple possibilities that I'll get to here in just a second. So model calculations assume that more than 6 million cubic meters of magma has now been added to the magma storage area under Svartsinghi since March 16th. In previous events, magma has moved out of the system from Svartsinghi when we had between 8 to 13 million cubic meters. So as more magma keeps accumulating here, we start enter, we begin entering the window in terms of volume of magma that was necessary in the prior events um, that initiated magma being in injected outward and to the east into these fractures, either as dikes uh, that stopped and didn't make it to the surface, or as dikes that propagated and fed an eruption. Um, and so we're, we're entering that, that territory. So more uncertainty about the development of the earthquakes in the coming days or week. So far, there's been talk of an increased probability of a magma flow and even a subsequent eruption in connection with the sequence of events in the Sunuk's Crater series. It's good to remember that a magma flow is a sudden and large flow of magma that flows out of a magma chamber and can end up with magma breaking up to the surface, or not. After the magma run on March 2nd, which did not end with an eruption, there was a change in the activity that has been fairly stable since December. So the March 2nd event, whatever that was, we don't know exactly what happened other than we know that there was magma that moved out of the storage chamber and moved into the fracture system but didn't result in an eruption. Um, that event seems to have changed the plumbing system, the conduits, the pathways that the magma moves through. And now all the, uh, everything we learned about this system in November, December, January, and February, it's kind of all been upended at this point. We're looking at a very different system and a very different uh, eruptive behavior as we move forward potentially. So if magma accumulation continues at a sim similar rate, the probability of another magma flow increases in the coming days or weeks, even though the eruption is still ongoing. So even though lava is getting out of, magma is getting out of the system, erupting as lava at the surface, we're still causing a lot of that magma to be stored. And if it continues to store and it continues to build volume and pressure, uh, it's going to have some critical point at, at, at some level. Getting magma flow out of the magma chamber in Svartsenghi together with the current eruption is a scenario that's not been seen before. So again, uncharted waters, we have not seen you know, an active vent erupting lava simultaneous with inflation and continued storage of magma in the subsurface. So here they lay out a few different scenarios, possibilities. So what, what will happen moving, for, moving forward is most likely to be one of the following. So uh, scenario number one, magma flows from the magma chamber under Svartsinghi into the Sunuk's crater series just like the last six times. So it keeps moving through the system and it comes out uh, just like we saw with these previous eruptions. Um, as a result of the magma flow, new fissures may open. So here's scenario number two. New fissures could open in the area between Stora Stogafelt and Hagafelt, and or existing vents may expand with a sudden increase in lava flow. It could happen with very little or no notice. So we could get in this region where we've seen several of these prior eruptions take place, we could get some new fissures opening up, okay? Uh, scenario, scenario number three, if a magma flow ends, with new fissures opening up elsewhere in the magma tunnel that formed on November 10th, a much longer notice can be expected. Most likely intense micro seismic activity, deformation and pressure changes in boreholes. So if we end up with brand new fissures opening up um, somewhere in a region, uh, whoops, let's get to the place that we want to here. Sorry about that. But if we end up with magma opening up in some other area, but still above this November 10th intrusion. So remember, 
on around November 10th, we had this intrusion or dike of magma, more or less here. We've seen these last few eruptions uh, open up in these areas. Um, and so again, the, the area they think would be most likely is between Stora Stogafelt, this hill, and Hagafelt here. But we could get something further to the north or further south, closer to town, and maybe even in an offshore region. So that's what that scenario is mentioning here. But we would most likely see um, the earthquake activity would increase. We would see some signals that would indicate that maybe we're going to have a new fissure, a new vent open up somewhere in the system. Uh, number four, it's also possible that there will not be a magma flow, but that the flow in the current eruption stops decreasing and begins to increase steadily into a new balance between the inflow of magma from below and the flow to the surface from the crater's reach. So this scenario says, hey, we're going to keep erupting the, the material through the vent that is currently erupting. So this little cute little spatter cone right here is continue, going to continue to be this, the main vent and the main player, but we're going to see it start to increase. So the amount of lava ejected and erupted here is going to increase because there's more coming into the system until the amount of lava erupting and the inflow of magma into the system uh, reaches some sort of balance. And then finally, scenario five, if a magma flow ends with new fissures opening somewhere other than in the area between Stora Stolgefelt and Hagafelt, such a scenario would most likely be accompanied by high seismic activity and deformation with considerably more advanced notice than previous volcanic eruptions. So remember that when we, you know, leading up to the December eruption and some of those other earlier eruptions, there was quite a bit of signal for that. Now, as time went on, the signals became less well established because we were using some of those same pathways to get the, that magma to the surface. Uh, and then what they have here is a graph that shows the volume of magma. So each little line here, colored line, is previous either eruptions or magma intrusions since uh, last November up through uh, now. And so our current situation is the red line here. And so the, the inflation of magma underneath Svartsengi has brought it up to about four, uh, cubic, 4 million cubic meters of magma. And then you could see these other ones where they landed at when, um, when we had storage there. So. Um, yeah, so that just kind of shows where we're at with those. Uh, they've updated the hazard map a little bit because now we're recognizing that the hazard uh, risk has increased a bit as we are inflating more, we're in, it's storing more magma, and that magma is going to most likely make its way to the surface or some of it at some point. Uh, and then the update from yesterday, I've spent a lot of time on the update here, but just a couple more things here, team. Um, Yesterday's update from the Met Office had some numbers for the area of the lava bed, the flow field, and the volume of lava that's been erupted since this eruption began on March 16th, so about 33 million cubic meters, covering an area of about a little over six square kilometers. Um, as we mentioned before, it's, it's making its way out of that vent at about three cubic meters per second. Land rise continues. Uh, there's still some gases and, and air quality issues. And then the last thing they threw out here, and I guess this was a few days ago, was a new uh, flow field map. And really because the only area that's significantly changing and adding lava over time is the uh, the area around the vent and just to the south of the vent, you can see how thick that lava is. So there's that primary spatter cone vent and most of the lava is coming out to the south out of the base of the cone. And so it's building up that perched perch pond and lava channel area just here to the south. So um, anyway, so that's it from the Met office. Um, there's also a fun site here that shows, and I can put this link in the description as well if you'd like to play around with this, but they add, uh, when satellites go over and take uh, mosaic photos of the area, you can actually pull those in so you can see what the area looked like, uh, let's say back on, let's see, these are all pretty new, but uh, January 14th. Um, so there's the active eruption uh, of January 14th, uh, and even the little a fissure that opened up that destroyed the three houses. So you can see that area there. Um, notice that at that time there was just the December 
flow field up here and then the January one, but then we can also add in the February eruption, which is very nicely contrasted with the snow there. So there's the February eruption and flow field. Uh, and then we can come in here and look at this most recent one from March 20th, uh, the area it covered. So remember back then it was erupting from uh, a Fisher series that included several vents. So there's those vents on March uh, 20th. And then going forward to April 8th, um, that primary cone. And then they just put together a new one here a few days ago. This is for uh, April 15th. So we can see the main spatter cone there. And unfortunately, the winds are going to the south here. So it's a little bit obscuring the perched pond channel area here. But you can see a little bit of glow there. Um, and then I think you can see, yeah, over here on the east margin, I told you, I think there's a tube system that's working, that's draining part of the lava pond and channel that's coming out through here because you don't see any lava on the surface here, no channel, but then there's uh, maybe another little pond here with some overflows here, and then this little flow channel here which goes out to the margin and it's burning some of the moss and stuff there and that's where you see a little bit of the, the gas and some smoke over in that area. So so this is a fun little site too that um, just has these more updated um, flow field uh, satellite imagery and, and then you can add um, and then they'll even you can even add in the actual outline of the flow fields so you can put in like here's the flow field as it stands for, for now for this March to today eruption um, and you can do that with some of these other ones here so fun little site to play around with they also have you know some of the the, the faults and the graben that that formed um, all sorts of different things here roads uh, the names of the hills the green are those protective berms that we've constructed around some of the infrastructure so I thought that would be fun to share let's look now at the earthquake data and again not a lot going on over the past 24 hours on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Nothing substantial near Grindavik. Looks like we've had maybe one uh, 1 1.7 earthquake in the vent area along the Sunnux crater series. A few random earthquakes near Fagordalsfjat um, and then a few random quakes over here in the Krishuvik system near Lake Klevravatn. And we did have a cluster there uh, during the past week, but not much happening over the past 24 hours. In fact, really not much happening of significance over uh, the entirety of Iceland. And the other uh, website we can look at for earthquakes, this is for the last three days. So this is looking at Tuesday to today, Friday. And so you can see just a couple here. Again, just not much happening. And even these tiny little dots you see here, um, these ones here are actually somewhat closer to the vent, but these are just super, super small quakes. Um, how big are those? Like point something, right? Point three. Yeah, so these are incredibly small earthquakes. Not significant. Um, if we pull in earthquakes over the past week, let's look at one week's worth of earthquakes here and see if we get anything. There's that cluster I talked about uh, last weekend near Lake Klevervatten. Uh, my interpretation was there was the one main 3.3 earthquake, and then most of these are aftershocks along that fault system there. So tectonic in nature, nothing indicative of magma uh, causing those quakes. Then we also had this fun little cluster of quakes just to the west and northwest of Grindavik. Uh, these were all super small earthquakes. I don't know what the biggest one is, but you know, 0.8. I don't even know if there was anything above a one. There might have been maybe one that was that big. 0.9, yeah, so very small earthquakes. Again, not indicative of magma movement, more likely uh, just the, the area is being stressed by the movement of the magma and just triggering these small little quakes in uh, areas in the region. So, so let's get to the GPS data. Um, and the, the main trend we're seeing here, I'm just gonna jump right in with to the Svart Sengi station. We can look at a few others as well. Um, but you can see this upward trend here, right? That it's 
it's becoming a little more established now. We ha- kind of had this thing. There was time when we were kind kind of weren't sure if this was even trending upwards. It did somewhat flatline mostly in this uh, in this period of time, but since about um, I don't know what is this like early April or so, um, there's been pretty steady uplift in the system. A couple places where it's maybe accumulating or rising a little bit more slowly, uh, but we can see now it's pretty substantial. What will be interesting to see, of course, is you know with each of these prior events, the maximum elevation reached just before the eruption um, was at a point that when we inflated the system for the next eruption, it always went to a much higher point. And so even though we're pretty close here, uh, as we stand on April 19th to the elevation that was reached prior to the March 16th eruption. Um, if the trend we have been following holds, and we don't know if that's true, we might expect this thing to rise still another you know, tens of millimeters, possibly 100 millimeters before anything substantial happens. So we'll just kind of have to see what happens with that GPS data moving forward. Um, maybe looking at another station, let's pull up the... Why are they so small? Let's pull up maybe the Blue Lagoon station and take a quick peek at that one. Uh, Here we go, right here. Yeah, so the Blue Lagoon station, again, just strong, steady uplift trend there. Uh, You can see, I don't even have to enlarge these. You can just see them all. There's the Edelvorp station, uh, the station near Grindavik. Uh, you can just see since April, about this point here, all these stations having this little trend upwards. So so the GPS data seems to be very much indicating that we're seeing um, inflation due to more magma in, uh, going into the system. One last little news item here um, that I thought was interesting. And again, thanks to Amanda Joe for sending me a lot of this information that I can digest. And she helps find a lot of this stuff and saves me a lot of time scrolling through the internet, trying to find uh, Icelandic news stories and information. Uh, so this one here from, uh, this is Benedict Ofigsen, who's a uh, with the Met office. And so he says that in the next two weeks, there could there could be enough magma in the system to start a new eruption. Uh, and then he goes on to say, as we kind of saw with the Met Office update, that you know it could be a new vent, it could be coming out of the same system, um, it could, but it said most likely, it's likely that such an eruption would start in a similar way to previous eruptions. It's about half of what it was before the eruption started, so when he's talking about the magma that's accumulated. Seems to be pretty stable, the pressure is beginning to approach the limits it has been in it has been in when previous eruptions or intrusions have started. So more or less reiterating things we've talked about here, um, but just a, a new story on that front. And then finally, um, the uh, this little story here, or I guess sort of uh, press release, I guess, out of a research group in Iceland comparing different uh, lava samples. So the they compared the composition of different lava samples over time. So you can see the December eruption, January, f- a couple February data points here, and then March, the, starting with the, the March eruption on March 20th. Well, the eruption began March 16th, but the data was collected on the 20th, the 27th, and then all the way up to April 8th. And this is looking at, um, I believe this is the concentration of, let's see, I didn't quite look at this all. Oh yeah, the blue dots are magnesium oxide and the orange dots are titanium oxide. So these are uh, indicators. You can see they're very similar, right? Like right around 6% uh, with magnesium oxide, around two or so with the titanium oxide. And I'm no geochemist, so this is me learning with you. Uh, So we'll just kind of read this together um, and see what their interpretations of this data is. Here's the important point I think here. Uh, the magnesium contents, and when you have an increase of magnesium, it can be used as a proxy for magma that originated deeper in the crust, and they don't see that change significantly. So um, if, if the eruption was, if these eruptions were tapping a progressively deeper source down in the mantle, uh, we might see these trend upward, but we don't. They're kind of staying the same, 
And this suggests that the magma that feeds the mid-crustal reservoir beneath Swartzengi either re-equilibrates re very quickly at mid-crustal conditions or causes eruption of magma already present. So we may already have so much magma that intruded into that area around November 10th, maybe again on March 2nd, that we're, we're mixing that fresh supply of magma with some of that slightly older magma, and that's what's keeping those concentrations the same. Um, or it's somehow re-equilibrating. And I'm not sure I, I quite understand that process there, but it's, but it's, whatever it's doing, it's giving us very similar results over time with all these subsequent eruption, eruptions. So, so pretty interesting there, just some fun geochemistry, uh, some of the thin sections um, that they cut with, that show some of the crystals of different minerals, olivine, this is plagioclase, all this uh, background light colored material is all glass so um, so that's it team that's my erupt that's my eruption that's my update for today April 19th thanks for joining me appreciate your support of the channel uh, we will of course put together another update when we feel like there's some new data to look at but we are going into I guess you know again it feels like another round of uncharted waters with this current eruptive phase. I don't think anyone knows for sure where this is going to go and how this is going to play out. And I think that's exciting. That means we're going to learn, right? We're in the, we're in a, a phase where we're going to all learn from this eruption and how this, uh, this magma system responds to what's currently taking place. And I'm looking forward to that journey and sharing that with you. So thanks again for joining me. Have a great day and we will see you soon. Take care.